Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 69 the happiest place in the NBA. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my entertaining and informative co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm good, and you? I'm doing all right. So we have a well-balanced show for you today. We've got uh, a couple stories on our Disney detective. We're going to be talking about uh, the NBA being saved in some form by Disney. Uh, Then we will talk about Disneyland reopening, or will it be reopening? Then we have news on the Marvel side with WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier news. Then in our Star Wars insights, we'll be talking about what Star Wars nearly looked like with some very nostalgic uh, characters Mm -hmm. and images. Yep. Uh, And then we will get an update on The Mandalorian Season 2 from Jon Favreau. And in our entertainment news, one of my favorite entertainers is now in the news, Don Henley, uh, talking to Congress about some uh, changes to the copyright law he'd like to see. Then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week like we usually do. And I think we got ourselves a good show this week. Ready to get started? Sure, let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So the NBA took a major step forward getting back on the court on uh, this past Thursday with the League of um, League's Board of Governors approving a 22-team format for restarting the league season next month at Disney, which we've been talking about off and on. Uh, they were talking about doing it in Las Vegas. They were talking about Disney. And it seems Disney now has has won out. So the teams would arrive in Disney around July 7th, and they would play an eight-game slate of games starting on July 31st at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex. Uh, all the teams will stay, practice, and play at Disney, and the NBA Finals will probably stretched in, uh, be stretched out into October because of the time um, that you know that they haven't been playing since the pandemic, you know, started in in March. Um, so they're you know still kind of working things out with it. Um, You know, there's health measures they have to look into, um, you know, and and figure it out. But basically, they've determined that it's the 22 teams that were already ahead when the season had stopped. So they're not bringing all of the teams in. There are, obviously, there's more than 22 teams uh, in it. Um, As of right now, they've actually decided that the 2021 season will be tentatively starting December 1st. So if you have your playoffs in October, it doesn't really give you a lot of time off before, you know, your next season starts. So, um, you know, so obviously the teams that aren't playing in the finals will probably starting up, you know, practice at, at some point. Um, I'm sure, you know, soon, because again, the season's going to be starting, you know, 
they're all kind of off, you know, uh, schedule and, and whatnot. Um, and also, they're looking to uh, cut down the number of games before the playoff. Normally, they play 82 games, um, but they're only going to be playing 71 to 75 games uh, during this time. Um, so the 22 uh, teams, uh, you know, they I guess there were teams that were already in playoff positions. So they're still, like, everybody's still in their same spot. It's just that obviously, uh, you know the the te- the nine teams. Um, I'm sorry, the the couple of teams that uh, aren't in, they're done now for the season. Their their season is done. So that's Atlanta, Cleveland, New York, Golden State, Minnesota, Detroit, Chicago, and Charlotte. So they're pretty much done. We're now everybody else. Now they have to start getting ready to head down to Disney World. So. So I'm curious what the effect this is going to have on Disney. Obviously, this is a uh, a profit making venture for Disney. Oh, but I'm sure. Is this also part of their hey, let's get people back to the parks because you might be rubbing elbows with NBA celebrities? Is that well, kind of the, an angle they're running? And that's the whole thing. You figure they're probably going to be. You know, during the day, if they're having practices, which I'm sure they will, they'll be at Wide World of Sports. It didn't, the article didn't say anything about, now normally nobody goes to Wide World of Sports unless there's some activity going on there or you have a ticket for something or there's an event uh, or, you know, a marathon weekend or or something like that. So I'm guessing they're probably going to close it off to the public. So unless you're there as part of the NBA, you're not going to be going there. Now, it didn't mention anything about like their families because that was kind of something we had said was that, oh, well, the families could go and the families could go to Disney because the parks will be opening, you know, around that time. So what will your families be doing you know yeah. well i mean even if you figure they're going to have downtime at some point right if the parks are open you know the celebrities the athletes are going to be going to the parks probably with their families at some point in time right um so it's one of those things where if you're an nba fan this might be a great time to, to yeah, do a disney could, vacation sure if you want to you, wanna, you know take the risk but that's the other thing too is again we don't know if their family is is going and then that's the other thing is what are the health restrictions is it something where they're not allowed to socialize you know or go any right. place right. you know they've not announced anything along those right. lines right and they haven't point. said like what resort cuz we know not every resort is is probably going to be opening so is their plan to basically well, I have I would guess these guys aren't staying at the all star <laughs> No, you don't think they're pl- staying probably in the basketball? Not, no. no, they're probably staying at the Grand Floridian or, you know, someplace. And the thing is, like, Grand Floridian has so many different buildings that, you know, you could house them all, Sure, you know, yeah. in, in one or two of them. Well, and you figure um, if you just house them at the Magic Kingdom resorts, right. you can keep literally the entire NBA oh yeah at just one yeah exactly so it'll be interesting to see how they go forward with the logistics of everything and and now has there been any talks of doing this for any other sports no this is this this is the only one that they've that they've really talked about you know I know they've been you know hinting about baseball you know coming back but Nothing because you know, you know Disney's Wide World of Sports is more than capable of hosting multiple. Oh sports. yeah, I think the only thing they couldn't host there would be like ice hockey. I don't know. I don't know if they have a a, a hockey. Well, if they do, they probably don't have enough active hockey. Right, they might do. only have like one because I I think the the Mighty Ducks might you know might have practiced there, so they might only have like one or two. If that, but interesting. So, if you're an NBA fan, there is some yeah. Good so news the season, the yeah. So you'll you'll as have, long as you're not a fan of you know one of the teams that have been eliminated. Yeah, just start liking <laughs> another one. But you know what? I think you know, and we've been you know joking about this when you know when you're looking at the TV guide and you see ESPN playing you know the Super Bowl from ten years ago and the World Series from five years ago, sure. and people are so desperate 
for sports. Well, that's like that, even at work, we keep the TVs on in the lunchroom. Right. And ESPN's always on one of the TVs. Mm -hmm. And just to listen to what the sports commenters are talking about at this point in time is... It's ridiculous because there's literally nothing to talk about. Right. So you have a feeling that e even if you don't like basketball, you're going to all of a sudden people become are, a people are going to become basketball, basketball fans, fans just because just, you need some sport. Right. If if you're that type of person who who is having that, oh my god, I I I, I need some sort of fix. Yeah. <laughs> I need to watch some sport, and all of a sudden you're going to become a fan of you know Boston now or, yeah. or something just because. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. They might get a resurgence in you know the amount of fans that they've uh, had before. So uh, yeah, that's very possible. Yeah. So tell us about the possibility of Disneyland reopening. So according to the OC Register, the state of California has decided theme parks would begin would be able to open again during stage three of the government's four stage process to reopening the economy. Of course, that depends on their infection rate and, you know, remaining stable. So as for when that'll happen, uh, California governor hinted earlier in May that it could happen sooner than expected. He said phase three is not a year away. It's not six months away. It's not even three months away. It may not even be more than a month away. Uh, we just want to make sure we have a protocol in place to secure customer safety, employee safety, and allow the businesses to thrive in a way that is sustainable. He had kind of hinted that June 3rd might be a potential date for shifting into stage three. Um, so Disneyland and Californ Disney's California Adventure aren't the only theme parks, obviously, that would be allowed to open under Stage 3. Um, there's Universal Studios Hollywood, Knott's Berry Farm, Magic Kingdom, and Legoland that are all affected by this. Um, so as of right now, none of those parks have made any sort of announcement as to when they would be um, opening up. Obviously, the only major domestic theme parks that have some sort of schedule um, is obviously Universal Orlando, Islands of Adventure, and Volcano Bay, which we had talked about previously. They were starting to open um, the beginning of this week. They were doing um, just cast member opening, then they were doing um, pass holder, and then finally opening up for uh, the public. As just a little side note to all of this, um, we have a, a friend who happens to work for Universal um, in, in Orlando, um, and he was affected by, by this. He was out of work, finally was able to go back to work. He said the first day wasn't so bad. Um, the second day, you had um, certain guests who were very much adhering to the rules and then you had a lot of what he said entitled people who just felt like they didn't have to um they weren't wearing their masks correctly they were wearing them below their nose or below their face and on their chin um they had markings kind of you know around you know stand here don't stand here and just some people were were very much by the rules and then others were just like whatever and these were pass holders so these were the people that you would have thought if nothing else they would have been the ones adhering you know to, to everything so he said he he's really praying for humanity at, at this point because if this is what things are going to be like when they open up a little bit more it, it's going to be hard you know basically telling these people, you, you know, know, you have to follow the rules if you want to be here. Hearing that news is exactly why I have no interest of going down mm -mm. at this point in time. No. Because you can implement all the rules that you want. You are going to have a certain segment of the population mm -hmm. that will think that they're entitled to not do those because they'll have some irrational idea that it's a right. violation of their of, privacy, right. of mm -hmm. their personal choice or whatever it is. And it's really going to come down to what the willingness is of the proprietors mm -hmm. to enforce those rules. Yeah. If you're going to impose rules and people aren't going to follow them and you're not going to enforce them, then 
do away with the rules. Right. Let everyone know that you're not doing the rules. Right. And then people, the smart people like us, mm-hmm. will just not, you know, go, go. down there at that right. point in time. Yeah. And that's and that's what I'm hoping is that they ha- that they're going to have a heightened, you know, security base walking around, ma- you know, making sure everybody's following the rule. And if you don't, you get one warning. And if you, you know, don't adhere or you give them problems, then they will exercise their right to escort you off of their property because you're not following but their rules. The, but the problem that you run into is that there are businesses that are doing that now. Right. And they're meeting violent oh, opposition absolutely. To, that, to the point yeah. that people are being assaulted mm-hmm. yeah. and people are being shot and killed mm-hmm. for trying to to enforce these rules. Right. That are there for everybody's safety. Right. And, and the yeah. problem that you yeah. have is if people are going to become deadly right. just because you're trying to enforce safety rules, there's no hope of this yeah surviving at this point in time um and and i saw a statistic yesterday that globally the number of coronavirus infections have taken an uptick uh record wise where you're seeing more than a hundred thousand people and more than a thousand people a day infected Mm. every day which had only happened for five days during the three months prior to that but it's occurring every day now worldwide because everyone's getting exposed to it now because the restrictions are being lifted. Right. So uh, I don't know if there's much hope out there for for that. I'm hoping that, you know, we get some treatment for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks like it's going to be here to stay, and we're not going to be able to avoid it, so hopefully we can find a way to survive it. Yeah. So on to, I guess, better news after <laughs> that. Tell us about... Our Marvel shows, our anticipated Marvel shows. So it seems that Disney Plus subscribers will get Marvel shows like Loki, WandaVision, and Falcon Winter Soldier on time, but just not as much as they were expecting. So according to Disney Plus Help, the Falcon and Winter Soldier is still scheduled for fall 2020, and WandaVision is still scheduled for a December 2020 release. But it's rumored that we will not be getting their season in their entirety. Um, So reports that came out said Falcon and Winter Soldier and WandaVision will be released, but with a half season. Uh, Disney's reasoning is reportedly that it started, um, that it starved for new content and can't afford to wait until filming and post-production can be completed for the rest of the season. Which kind of makes sense because we've seen that with other shows um you know walking dead is a perfect example they had one <laughs> the season finale couldn't go into post post production you know they filmed everything that they could but they couldn't complete it um but it seems you know everybody's looking for something to watch and people are tired of you know reruns of things and you know so they want to get stuff out there and obviously we've seen that you know frozen got released early uh um onward got released early star wars got released early so they've been you know releasing things earlier so obviously they want to kind of keep that momentum going but they just don't have the full season um you know, ready yet. So, you know, usually the seasons are between six and eight episodes and it looks like when they do get released, we're only going to get half of that. So between, you know, three and four episodes, um, you know, for each show. So don't binge watch them. (laughs) Take your time. (laughs) Watch like one every two weeks, you know, kind of make it last. Um, And maybe they'll probably do, they'll probably be releasing it the same way that they do with most of their other shows is they only release one episode a week. So they might even do that where they kind of stretch it out you know, for, for the consumer so that you, you don't have that <laughs> binge watching at, at one time. So, but it, it's nice to, to hear that that'll, you know, that those will still be on track. We're still going to see them before the end of the year. We just won't get to see the whole season just yet. Well, and you know, the one interesting thing about the, um, the scenario itself is it's almost 
a matter of the styles of the streaming service. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, you have uh, you have Disney, mm-hmm. who relies very heavily on a back catalog of material, um, whereas you've got Netflix, who they have this extensive back catalog, but they also, when they release, they release everything at once. Mm-hmm. So as a result, they have a much longer um, uh, pipeline right. for their material. So they've got material that's already produced and ready to go. They schedule to release it, they drop it, and then they're ready to drop something else. So they've got a number of shows that are through their production already and ready to go, unlike right. Disney, where Disney is... Almost like a regular television mm-hmm. network. They're producing and releasing and producing and releasing. Uh, so they don't get multiple seasons ahead. They don't have all that many uh, original series that they're working on right now compared to a Netflix mm-hmm. or an Amazon Prime. Um, and they're staggering their releases. Uh, and Disney does it legitimately. They do it so they, they can extend your uh subscriptions out. Right, right. Because let's face it, if they dropped all of The Mandalorian season one at once, everyone would have binge watched it and canceled their subscription within a month. And there were people that did that, that, you know, gave it two months and, Which is also why Disney did not, Disney gives you the shortest trial period as well. Yeah. So that you can't binge watch They only give you the seven days. But it turns out, you know, granted no one could have possibly prepared for uh, the, the, corona situation like we have right now uh, but that's exactly why disney is hard up right now for mm-hmm. original material yeah uh, you you and maddie in your movie nights have basically ground through a vast library of disney movies already it's amazing how many more there still still are that we haven't you know seen and and one of the things is because they made so many I wouldn't say bad sequels, but they made some, you know, interesting direct-to-video sequels. Right. Not like, you know, a Toy Story 2 or a Frozen 2. You know, Hunchback of Notre Dame 2 was not something, you know, right. that, that played in, in the theater. But it's kind of interesting to, to see that. And also, we're watching movies that, you know, aren't part of that you know, normal um, catalog, you know, that they were movies that were made, you know, so it's interesting to see, you know, how how Disney movies, you know, started and kind of had a decline and they came back up and, you know, so it, it's interesting from that perspective, you know, so fortunately we still have plenty to, right. to go through, but again, there's still not as much new content out there like, you know, some of the other services have. Right, so. right. But, you know, to see that that philosophy, that production and release philosophy that Disney subscribed to is now, is what's hurting it right mm-hmm. now, just like yeah. it's hurting your regular network television mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. They have the same, same problem. Mm-hmm. So I think, if anything, uh, this situation itself is really going to lend itself to seeing streaming services take off because they're going to be filling this gap. Mm-hmm that a lot of network television can't film. Yeah, yeah. So, that was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk about our Star Wars insights. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. We 
go for Star Wars Insights. That's the wrong button. <laughs> That's the Star Trek Insights. How about... There we go. That was like... Sacrilege, I know. Blasphemy! <laughs> Sorry. I can't do this podcast anymore. <laughs> I don't know who you are. Wrong key on the soundboard. <laughs> production faux pause. That's like, you know, live production. Wow. Gotta love it, right? Wow, man. I, I just don't even know where to begin. Anyway, Star Wars <laughs> Insights. So this was a, a, a funny little story that, that came up. Um and I figured we'd, we'd throw it in. So Star Wars is obviously packed with legendary actors, um, you know, and that perfect cast. But what's funny is it wasn't nearly as perfect as, as it came to be. So before Star Wars was, sh was shot, it was so low on 20th Century Fox's agenda that they actually gave George Lucas the merchandising and sequel rights in lieu of a salary, thinking that they'd save themselves $350,000. Whoops! They lost out on $1.6 billion. That's kind of funny when you, when you think about it. Um, but obviously, with that... Now we're, we're finding out that there were other stars that were considered for some of these main roles. So, Han Solo, how would you feel if Al Pacino had played the role? Um, you know, he said, uh, he said, it was mine for the taking, but I just didn't understand the script. Um, obviously, he went on to do The Godfather and... Um, you know, and famous line of, I'm going to make him an offer I can't refuse. You know, he could have said, hey, get in there, you big furry oaf. I don't care what you smell, you know. So, it, you know, it definitely would have been a much different Star Wars with, with Al Pacino as Han Solo. Um, another actor up for Han Solo was James Caan. So he obviously starred with Pacino in The Godfather, and uh, he actually was quoted as saying, you know, they didn't want an actor, and that's why they got Harrison Ford. Um, little did they know, Harrison Ford would obviously go on to be very successful in his movie well, career. because Harrison Ford at the time <laughs> right. was a carpenter. Right. And George had basically called him in just to read lines with the people that were rehearsing. Right, right. So, you know, plenty of... Other actors obviously auditioned for the role. Now, um, Sylvester Stallone claims that Lucas never even looked at him during his tryouts, but Kurt Russell, Christopher Walken, Nick Nolte, and even Freddy Krueger himself, Robert England, had a chance at the role. Um, England, who was actually too young for the role, um, did suggest Mark Hamill. He said, yeah, there's this kid that's sleeping on my sofa after, you know, a six-pack of beer. And he actually tried out for Luke Skywalker, and obviously we know how that turned out. Um, so that was the, the people for Han Solo. Princess Leia. They were actually looking at Jodie Foster. Um, she said that she uh, was actually doing two back-to-back -back films at the time, uh, which were Taxi Driver and Bugsy Malone. And she said, it would have been fun, but my career would have definitely gone in a different direction and I'm happy with the one that I got so I really don't regret it but she said honestly I was 14 or 15 at the time and you know it would have been kind of weird you know uh, convincing those characters you know that I was a little older um, and it would have been a different concept you know for the film then of course having the love interest of um, uh Harrison Ford, there's a 20 year difference between them. So that would have definitely taken a different uh, angle, you know, if they had gone with, with her. Um, now, this was interesting for Grand Moff Tarkin. Christopher Lee was actually um, asked to do the role, um, but he said that he wasn't interested in, uh, you know, being part of it. But he actually suggested his friend and on screen nemesis. Peter Crushing for the role. So that's how, you know, Peter Crushing got got into the and role. That's, that was the old Hammer Films tie-in yeah. with Cushing, Christopher Lee, David yeah. Krause. Yeah, yeah. So, and obviously, we know that Christopher Lee did eventually become part of the Star Wars family and, you know, Count Dooku. 
Um, Luke Skywalker, one of our favorite uh, 80s uh, uh, television series, The Greatest American Hero, uh, William Cat was actually, um, you know, pegged to, to, to do this. And there's actually some footage of him and Kurt Russell having an audition for for this role. Um, so, you know, he he was that boy next door look, you know, that they they wanted to uh, to have. But obviously it ended up going to to Mark Hamill because he had more of what George Lucas w- was looking for. Um, so I'm going to totally kill this this name. Um, but for Obi-Wan Kenobi, it was actually a Japanese actor, uh, Toshiro Mufune. Um, and this is kind of why the, the name has that sound to it. Um, so it was basically like a fanboy wish list. So George Lucas was a huge fan of, you know, Japanese martial art movies. And one of the big stars at the time, um, was, was, uh, uh, Toshiro, and he had actually asked him, you know, to play play this part. Obviously, he turned it down. Uh, his daughter had claimed that her father, who Lucas actually offered the role of Darth Vader, was worried that Lucas would make the samurai ethos look cheap. So they obviously changed plans, but you could almost see how different the, the movie would have been if they had, you know, gone with you know, those actors, um, you know, and would it have gone on, you know, for all the sequels, you know, if, you know, you had a different cast, uh, you know, in place. So I thought that was a kind of a, a cool little uh, story that popped I, up. I can't help but think of Star Wars with Pacino as Han Solo. <laughs> Pacino would have had to have played the, the gangster, not... You know, right? He definitely he, he would have been Job of the Hut. Really, <laughs> I could totally see that. Yeah, yeah, that definitely would have been you know different. Plus, he's you know he's not very tall either. So, you know, and he's not a pilot. And he's not. <laughs> How do you know that? Are you sure? I'm he's not. <laughs> but I do know that Han Solo. Harrison Ford is a pilot. Yes, he definitely not is a pilot. Not a very good one because he keeps well, getting killed with the FAA, but he is a pilot. Well, it's been a while. It's been a no, while. No, it's been recent. He's oh, actually, really? The FAA is investigating another oh, incident. Oh, God. So. Poor Harrison. Yeah, well, you know, got to stay on the right track, I guess. Yeah. So, any anyway, interesting. Very interesting to see how Star Wars could have turned out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, let's talk about The Mandalorian. So, The Mandalorian, yay, remains on track to... Uh, debut its second season in October. John Favreau had said we were lucky enough to have finished photography before the lockdown. Um, thanks to how technology forward Lucas and ILM are, we have been able to do all of our visual effects and editing and post production remotely through systems that have been set up uh, by both companies for us. So, yay! Um, he had noted that, you know, due to the rigors of the television schedule, season two actually feels more of a continuation of season one than a brand new thing. He said, um, as we explore partnering with new filmmakers and having new characters and going deeper with the character we already have, it's really been fun and fulfilling. And I hope people are having as much fun seeing it as we have making it. So that's obviously good news that, you know, as of right now, we're going to get the full season and it's going to come out in October, a year after, no, a little, uh, um, when did the first season come out? Was that October or was it? Yeah, it was the end. Um, so Disney Plus obviously doesn't release uh, viewership data, but the first season of The Mandalorian made a big, sla- uh, big splash with pop culture. Uh, Baby Yoda obviously became the surprise breakout star, and Disney's Bob Iger had noted that the show will go on beyond season two and could even spin off characters into their own series. Dun, dun, dun. So, yay! Full season... Right on track. Well, and honestly, this doesn't come as much of a surprise <coughs> because the level of technology that they're using on the oh show my God, yeah. now 
Like it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that they're they're capable of of doing their post production stuff mm-hmm. remotely. Uh, we see a lot of TV shows now that are live TV shows mm-hmm. that are uh, recording remotely. Mm-hmm. They're doing their post production remotely, and you're getting pretty quality, high quality mm-hmm. productions out of these. And if all the sh- shooting had been done already, which it sounds like it had been for for uh, season two. Mm-hmm. Post production could be done in somebody's basement with the right hardware. Yeah. So uh, it's good to see that they were set up for it. It's not mm-hmm. surprising, uh, but it is very reassuring to know that we've got some light at the end of the tunnel. That come October, we're getting our season two. Yay, Baby Yoda! So that's great <laughs> news. Now maybe Disney will get on the ball and get the Disney the Baby Yoda merchandising out the door. Well, on the they're doing. It's, it's coming out slowly, slowly but, but surely. It's all, coming. You know, eight months later. But you Better can, late than never. I, I guess. Okay, I, I guess. Anyway, that's all we had for our Star Wars Insights. Mm-hmm. We'll be back in a moment with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Get on that. <laughs> anyway, we're. <laughs> We're, we're back. We were just bantering <laughs> about getting some guests on the show. Yeah, he's like, get some guests. So he was like, get Harrison uh, Ford. Harrison oh, sure. Ford, I'll totally do the show. Come on. He and I are old <laughs> friends. <laughs> totally call him up. <laughs> anyway, I'm totally oh, unprepared. For this you are. Now. <laughs> uh, see, you, you did the whole Star Trek thing. And I know. Star I'm, Wars, I'm you're just Totally off today. Done. Totally off. Uh, anyway, so in the news, we have Don Henley talking to Congress. Um about copyright law, copyright law. So tell us about right. that. Right. So Don Henley, who was one of the songwriters for the Eagles, is urging Congress. Uh, he did more than just write songs for the Eagles, for the record. He was a songwriter. He was a primary vocalist. And he did drums. And he plays guitar. Would you like to do the story? No, no. Please, go ahead. I'm just making sure the man gets proper credit. That's all. That's really what this whole story is about, isn't it? No, it's not. It has nothing to do with any of that, actually. It's about giving credit. Oh, okay. So uh, he is urging Congress to protect artists against online pirating, wading into the copyright fight that's actually pitted between Hollywood and the recording industry against big tech uh, platforms like Google's YouTube. Um, so the blockbuster hit maker of the 70s, is that a better? That's, uh, that's I, better that's for acceptable. him? That's <laughs> acceptable. Um, actually testified online from his home before the Senate Judiciary Committee weighing possible changes to a 1998 copyright law. Uh, the law allows holders of copyrighted material to formally ask parties that they believe have taken their content without permission to remove it. The parties can claim, uh, dispute the claim. If they comply promptly with the request, there are no legal consequences. Otherwise, they're subject to criminal penalties. Um, so the so-called take uh, notice and takedown system under the copyright law is used by the movie and recording industries, entertainment software companies, and book authors to pursue tech platforms, universities, and other facilitate facilitators of file sharing. Henley called the copyright law a relic of the MySpace error in a TikTok world. That made me laugh. Well, you know, he's good at lyrics. <laughs> and that he actually knew what TikTok was. That's impressive. 
So with hundreds of millions of takedown notices sent for every link taken down, he said a dozen more pop up in its place. Uh, the system still allows big tech to rake in revenue um, after repeated, you know, the copyright infringements. Um, so the copyright battle has been spotlighted in Congress uh, at a time when U.S. tech giants are in an escalating feud with the president and Republican lawmakers who are accusing platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, and Google of suppressing conservative viewpoints. So all this is kind of, you know, linked together. So, you know, in a debate between online pirating, um, the committee has been, you know, making its learnings known. Um, you know, they've said that, you know, piracy has become easier and faster and much, much more common. Uh, the current system is failing and it's failing badly. So, you know, copyright holders maintain that some network operators have munip uh, manipulated internet provider addresses in a way to make other networks appear responsible for their file sharing. Uh, entertainment industries have been pushing tech formats uh, platforms to do more for themselves to police the content that violates the copyright. And then, of course, on the other side, the users of the content have accused copyright holders of alleging infringements where it doesn't exist. Internet companies say that they have worked actively with the creative industries to block access to illegal content and protect the copyrights. So this is one that I have to get up on my soapbox. About. I knew you would. Um, <clears throat> first off, as an artist, he has every right to protect his intellectual property. Mm -hmm. I don't want to deny that. Right. Uh, a couple of problems that I have here is right now the system that they have with automated algorithms that determine if you're using content mm -hmm. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've been victims of that. Yep. Number of times. Okay, so there have been incidents where we've shown uh, clips from um, movie trailers mm -hmm. and we've gotten orders to take down where it's kind of idiotic that you're having me take down free advertising for you. But OK, we'll we'll take that. We've had incidents where I've used um, this show, as a matter of fact, our outro music for this show, our original outro music, came from a royalty-free site that I paid a membership for that site to use their material mm -hmm. and got notifications for takedowns, even though the material that I had, I had every legal right to use. Right. So I could either take it down or I could fight them in court. And being a nonprofit, no profit, you know... <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the red, you know, podcast that we are here with right. no income coming in for the podcast, I right. couldn't afford to do that. Right. So I had to take it down, even though I had every legal right to use it. Mm -hmm. And I paid for that legal right. Right. We had an incident where we had a guest of the show who was a performer. Mm -hmm. We went to a live performance where he was using music uh, that was based on original work from the Eagles by the way, mm -hmm. that he had rearranged himself and was using a legal version of it for backing music for his live show, mm -hmm. which we recorded and included on the podcast, which was caught by the automated algorithms and forced to take down. Mm -hmm. I didn't go and record an Eagles concert and right. put it up there. I recorded this independent artist mm -hmm. who was covering the song legally in a public venue right. and I had to take it down. So the system itself doesn't work. I'll totally agree with Don Henley. It's not working in his favor right now though. And that's where the problem comes mm -hmm. where the system itself airs on the side of the artist and the copyright holder right now. And you have almost no recourse if you're going to use it online. The second problem that I have is Don Henley is appealing to Congress to rule on a law that is out of date because of technology. Mm -hmm. One thing that Congress is notorious for is being completely divorced from any type of technological understanding whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They try to apply the most draconian um, 
simplistic viewpoints to anything that has anything to do with technology. And anytime Congress or the U.S. government are invited to rule on anything with technology, they invariably always rule the, the opposite way that they should be ruling. And it's because they don't understand the technology, they don't understand the implications that it has, they don't understand the forethought that goes into this. Um, you look at things like the Patriot Act or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. These are all things that have hindered techno technological advancement. They have stolen away rights of citizens because of some high, you know, falutin idea of what the government power should be. And ultimately, every time the government is invited to rule on laws that are affected by technology, they do it wrong. So as a citizen, as a technologist, um, as a lover of music and, and talent like Don Henley, um, I totally support his desire to keep his uh, control of his music and his content, but he's doing it the exact wrong way that he should. You're inviting Congress to get involved in something they don't understand, right. that they aren't going to make the right decisions on, and ultimately, in the end, I'm going to lose as a consumer, he's going to lose as a copyright holder, and nobody's going to win. The federal government is just going to take on more and more control, and we're basically all screwed if they get involved. Um, you see what happens when you allow industry insiders to dictate copyright policy, and I'll give Disney as an example of that. You know, Disney lobbied to move... Uh, the copyright laws for public domain material several times in the history of copyright law. So now your copyright law stretches all the way back to like the 1930s at this point in time mm. because Disney wanted to protect Mickey Mouse and they didn't want Mickey Mouse to become public domain. So anytime that an industry giant like that is allowed to basically buy legislation, I have no idea. I'm not going to uh, allege that that's what Don Henley's doing, but any time that an industry giant, a, a studio or a recording industry, uh, tries to influence Congress, they've got far more chance to buy their own legislation than you or I do as citizens. Mm -hmm. And it's dangerous. And we're, we're far better off by not having the government get involved in things they don't understand. So I'm, I'm concerned the direction that this is going to go. Um, it doesn't make me like Don Henley or the Eagles any less, though, just for the record. Okay. That's my soapbox. Thank you. Anyway, that was all we had for <laughs> entertainment news this uh -huh. week. Uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with our insightful picks of the week. Okay. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a 2020 documentary called A Secret Love. Um, when we first see Terry Donahue on screen in the documentary A Secret Love, she is wearing a green t-shirt with the words, there's no crying in baseball. And movie fans that cherish that line from A League of Their Own in the 1992 film, based on the true story of the woman's first woman's professional baseball league founded in World War II. And there's a good reason for that. Because she was one of the real life athletes who played in the mall, the all American girl professional baseball league. Um, so what this documentary is about is about these two women who met and fell in love and for decades never t told anybody that they were actually in a relationship um, the two women lived together for nearly 60 years, and it wasn't until 2009 that they actually told their family that they were actually a partner 
in a partnership. Um, they, um, you know, had been out to gay friends for decades, but obviously it wasn't until much later that they told their family. Um, the one woman says that she felt like she was kind of living a lie and that, you know, she was afraid to tell her nieces and nephews because she was afraid that they weren't going to love her anymore. Um, so the documentary weaves back and forth between the present day and earlier moments um, in Pat and Terry's life, um, talking about how, um, you know, living in Canada for a little while and um, then living um in Chicago and, and, you know, moving around and, and how, you know, they had to kind of live their life, you know, in secret for, for so long. Um, you know, and very interesting. So they have old movies of them and, and video, uh, videos and, and, um, photographs of, of the two of them. And, you know, the, the kids, you know, the nieces and nephews were always like, we just, thought you guys were good friends um and they actually did have a they did legally get married um a couple years back um they ended up moving into a nursing home unfortunately uh the one woman uh pat did pass away last year um but they were able to finally have their truth you know, out. So it's a very loving story of, of these two women and, and to see, um, you know, the, they talk about how the, the one, um, the one woman, her parents, they think they kind of knew, but it was like the 1930s, 1940s. And it was, again, something you didn't talk about, but they didn't see anything wrong with them always hanging out. And there was never that pressure of why aren't you getting married? Why aren't you having kids? Or, you know, they just kind of let them be. Um, and it, it was nice to just see a, a nice love story, but between these two, these two women. Nice. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is a documentary, <gasps> back on the documentary kick. Uh, this is actually kind of a classic, not too classic, but not new either. Uh, this is a show called The Real Story uh, on the Smithsonian Channel. Uh, it was produced from 2007 through 2013 with some off years in between. <clears throat> uh, they've thrilled us, horrified us, and devastated us. They've raised questions about our past and given us hope for a brighter future. They are Hollywood's biggest hits, all works of fiction, but all inspired by real events more dramatic than anything a screenwriter could come up with. The real story goes behind the scenes of Hollywood's biggest movies and uncovers the actual characters and true stories that inspired them. The show explores the fictional stories and draws a direct parallel to the real stories that inspired them, explore the facts versus fiction of Platoon, Braveheart, Master and Commander, Apollo 13, Saving Private Ryan, and more. Uh, the Saving Private Ryan episode, for instance, shows how the fictional story of John Patrick Ryan was drawn directly from the story of the Nylon brothers, almost as a direct comparison. <clears throat> so the brothers, you know, the story of Private Ryan is, you know, he's a uh, one of four sons in a, in a family that go off to fight in World War II. His three brothers get killed in various ways. And uh, Tom Hanks and his troop of uh, uh, commandos are sent inland to uh, find Private Ryan, who was airdropped in as, mm -hmm. as part of the D-Day invasion. Uh, and their jobs to basically secure him and bring him back. <clears throat> and the story itself um, has a direct parallel to the Nylon Brothers. The whole thing was based on the um, sole survivor uh, rule that was put in place after the Sullivan Brothers. Uh, all, all four of them, five of them died on a Navy ship when it was torpedoed in okay. the South Pacific. So the government put in this sole survivor so if you're the last survivor of the of an entire family mm -hmm. you get basically get taken out of the war and sent home okay so 
this same thing happened to the Nyland brothers and the way that the Nyland brothers um, met their fate uh, was portrayed in the movie itself. One was shot down, one was killed at D-Day and so mm. forth. So the, so the stories itself played out. But what's interesting about uh, the real story is they go in and they show you the behind the scenes stuff. They'll show you, um, like for instance, the factual stories versus what's depicted in the movie itself. They'll even go so far as to do a forensic analysis to see if the way things are portrayed in the show, in the movies, actually could happen. Okay. Um, and again, I, I I go back to the Saving Private Ryan episode. There's a scene where they're landing on the beaches of Normandy and they're jumping over the sides of the Higgins boats to avoid getting a shot coming down the ramps. And there are scenes where they're in the water underwater being shot by incoming machine gun fire and the show itself actually goes out and does a forensic study of this and tries to recreate that by by firing rounds into a tub of water to see what the effects are and you know they they prove that that aspect of it was really a work of fiction in hollywood mm. because bullets don't behave the same okay in real life as they do in the movie there so it's a very interesting approach to looking at the movies. They look at historic movies, they look at how they're portrayed, and they look at how realistic they are. Braveheart's another great example. Okay. One of the most dramatic scenes um, in Braveheart is a Battle of Stirling Bridge, where the the Scottish forces under the command of uh, William Wallace defeat the British at Stirling Bridge because of the strategy of... Um, boxing them in as they cross the bridge and stuff like that. And they examine the fact that in the movie, there's no bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they completely changed how the movie portrayed a battle of Sterling Bridge when by not even having a bridge there. And But they go in and they talk about it because Sterling Bridge doesn't exist and it moved and this and that. And, and the landscape where they did the shooting wasn't correct for it. So it's very interesting to go in and... and Number one, see how the movies were shot, which is always fun, but to see how compromises had to be made hmm. um, in order to tell the story. Because sometimes the stories themselves, the real stories, no pun intended, don't always flow well enough for the movie screen. Hmm. So sometimes your directors have to take some creative uh, shortcuts in order to keep the story itself flowing. Uh, so it's a very interesting show. There's, uh, I think, five seasons in total across okay. that time. Uh, and they tackle all kinds of uh, different movies there. So the real story on the Smithsonian Channel. Very cool. So I think that was all we had this week. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any afterthoughts or anything, did you? Nope. Nothing okay. today. I think that was all we had this week. Uh, we invite you to subscribe to us. Uh, you can subscribe to our audio podcasts under Insights in Entertainment or our video podcasts uh, under Insights into Things. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and all major podcast providers. Or you can reach out and contact us directly. We do stream live six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can get us on, uh, I'm sorry, you can send us comments, not you can get us on. Well, you can email us or whatever uh, at comments at insights into things dot com. We are in the Twitterverse at insights underscore things. On YouTube, you can catch the video versions of all of the podcasts at youtube.com insights into things. You can get all of our episodes uh, as well as uh, show notes and transcriptions at insightsintothings.com on the web. For just the audio version of our podcast, you can go to podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Or you can go to the Evil Empire Facebook and get us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And I think that's it. That is it. We are done. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.